Grammar Girl is brought to you by Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world. Spanish is my language choice, but with Babbel, you have lots of choices. You could learn French, German, Italian, Turkish, or others. Babbel has lessons for 14 different languages, and they'll teach you how to have real-life conversations via your desktop, smartphone, or tablet. Because Babbel's interactive technology is so effective, you'll actually remember what you learn. And with convenient 10 to 15 minute lessons, you can learn wherever you are and whenever you can make time. And right now, my listeners can get three months of Babbel free by signing up for three months. Visit Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash grammar and use the offer code grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and this week I have a quick and dirty tip about how to use quotations and a meaty middle about why you might want to not call yourself a grammar Nazi. The quick and dirty tip was written by Edwin Battistella, so when I say I, it means him. I have a confession to make. I often skip the long blocks of quotes when I'm reading academic articles and books, and I suspect I'm not the only one who does this. I don't skip the quotes because I'm lazy. I skip them because they often pull me away from a writer's ideas rather than further into them. The writer has put a voice and an idea in my ear only to cede the floor to another voice, that of some quoted authority. A long quote, or worse, a series of them, can leave me asking, yes, but what was your point again? How does all this over-quoting arise? Well, in school, teachers require beginning writers to cite sources in their summaries, paraphrases, and direct quotations. But some students confuse research with mere quotation, and the weakest of them write research papers consisting of a series of whole paragraphs quoted from different sources. As writers get more sophisticated, they learn to find primary sources— to identify a source's authority and stance and to discuss the relevance of the quote to their own points. But many writers still quote too much and for the wrong reasons. Overquoting can become a lifelong bad habit. So when is it a good idea to quote? You should quote when you want to amplify a source's point with additional support and new evidence. And you should certainly quote when you want to disagree with a source. Letting the source speak for himself or herself helps to show that you're not mischaracterizing a writer's views when you challenge them. You also should quote when the language of the original is particularly significant, controversial, or evocative. That includes most literary quotations and many technical ones. But after you quote a technical point or definition, it's important to re-establish your voice by explaining why the quote matters. And before you quote, you should provide some context to what follows and introduce your source's bona fides. This is a well-known quote sandwich, consisting of framing, quote, and commentary. So when should you think twice about quoting? It's always a bad idea to quote if you're unsure of what the source is saying. When we're new to a topic or discipline, it's tempting to cite some technical language about a troublesome concept, hope the reader understands it better than we do, and change the subject. Such a quote-and-run approach is a recipe for frustrating the reader. There's also the temptation to quote at the ending of a section of an article or chapter to sum up a discussion with someone else's insight. Often, though, the quote will hang out there like an orphaned idea. Unless you can say why a quote is important in your own words, consider leaving it out. I also suggest avoiding long quotes if you're just citing someone who agrees with you. If you're both taking the same position, the reader doesn't need to hear it twice. Just summarize the point of agreement and move on to what you want to say. If the source's reasoning is important to your exposition, but not the actual language, a paraphrase will often suffice, perhaps with a short key phrase quoted. Paraphrasing in summary, with appropriate citations, naturally, allows you to maintain your own voice in a piece of writing. As you become more immersed in a topic and more of an expert, you'll tend to quote less 
more things will be common knowledge to you and the expert audience you're writing for. Quotes can be an important part of a writer's toolbox if they're used strategically. If you follow the relatively simple suggestions, your quotes will be more effective and readers will skip fewer of them. And you can quote me on that. That segment was written by Edwin Battistella and originally appeared on the OUP blog. He teaches linguistics and writing at Southern Oregon University in Ashland, where he served as a dean and as interim provost. He's written many books with Oxford University Press, including Sorry About That, The Language of Public Apology. Before we get to the meaty middle about the term grammar Nazi and some better choices, we have a new sponsor this week, Blinkist. The world's most successful people all have one thing in common. They're hungry for knowledge, reading and learning every chance they get. And since you're listening to this podcast, you probably feel the same way. And that's why you need to know about the Blinkist app. More than 2,000 best-selling nonfiction books transformed into powerful packs you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. You learn the essential ideas, all the main points from the best books in your field or subjects you never knew you loved, like productivity, business, and science. With Blinkist, you can feast your mind on key ideas from best-selling nonfiction books like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, The 4-Hour Workweek, and Thinking Fast and Slow, all on your way home. You can get more knowledge in less time. And their team is constantly adding new titles from best-of lists, so you're always getting more powerful ideas in a convenient, made-for-mobile format. Blinkist was chosen in Apple and Google's Best Of selection for two years. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com grammar and get a free trial or three months off your yearly plan when you join today. That's B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com slash grammar. And now, on to a rare opinion piece from me. When I'm asked to give people a bio, a paragraph about myself, I often end it with the sentence, She hates the phrase grammar Nazi and loves the word kerfuffle. This isn't a new sentiment. You can see it in the bio for my TED Talk from 2015. But it suddenly seems more relevant and more important. Some of you might remember the soup Nazi character from the 90s TV show Seinfeld, who was mean and had strict rules about how his customers should behave and would often shout, no soup for you, if customers didn't fall in line. People had used Nazi before Seinfeld to imply that someone was harsh or strident about rules, but it's likely that the character on Seinfeld made it more common. My dislike of the name Grammar Nazi had never seemed important enough to write about, but that was before we had Nazis openly marching in our streets with swastikas and torches. The Nazis represent an ideology of hate, They committed genocide, and the world fought a terrible war to defeat them. Historians estimate that between 50 and 80 million people died in World War II, including about 14 million people in Holocaust death camps. Just last month, I was in Europe and saw firsthand some of the destruction from World War II— and heard stories of towns that only escaped devastation because German bombs failed to detonate. Europe hasn't forgotten the price they paid to defeat the Nazis because it happened on their soil, but sometimes it seems as if far away, America has forgotten. I like word history as much as I like world history, and I often tell you about words whose meanings have changed, like egregious, which used to mean good and now means bad, and the word drapes, which people used to think was a wholly unacceptable replacement for the word curtains. I'm not generally opposed to language change. As I said in my TED Talk, language changes because we vote for or against new words and new meanings. Well, I cast the strongest vote I can against the phrase grammar Nazi. 
If you're the type of person who might be tempted to call yourself a grammar Nazi, then presumably you care about accuracy and being precise with your words. You probably dislike language change more than I do, for heaven's sake. And if you're a language fanatic, you know that words have power. There's a reason politicians hire consultants to help them find the most acceptable words to call things. And companies rebrand when their reputation gets so bad they can't get the stink off their name. Words have associations that matter. And there's a reason marginalized groups try to reclaim the words that have been used as slurs against them. Words can have power against people, and it's possible to take away that power. Using offensive words often or in a light or mocking way can make them less offensive. It's one reason swear words lose their offensiveness over time, and we have to come up with new offensive words to shock people. So let's vote against lightening the meaning of the word Nazi. Let's vote to preserve our collective memory that a Nazi is evil, that Nazis are people we won't tolerate, and that it's an ideology we rightly fight against. Let's not make Nazi a generic term for someone who's picky or strident or annoying or precise. You probably wouldn't call yourself a grammar serial killer or a grammar terrorist or say that you're part of grammar ISIS, so don't call yourself a grammar Nazi. And now I've left you with the problem of what you should call yourself— I actually don't use any kind of label like this for myself. I just say I love language or I love words. But other writers have suggested alternatives to Grammar Nazi. Andy Hollandbeck, a columnist for CopyEditing.com, has recommended the term errorist. Lizzie Skurnick, a writer for the New York Times Magazine, has recommended Gramando. John McIntyre of the Baltimore Sun coined the term Peververein, a blend of the word peaver and the German word for club or association. And Simon Horobin, a professor of English and literature at Oxford, surfaced to the word grammaticaster, which was used by the famous dictionary writer Samuel Johnson to describe a mean verbal pedant. Stan Carey, a frequent writer for the Macmillan Dictionary blog, has compiled a large collection of alternatives, including many of those I've already mentioned, plus grammar grouch and language crank. I don't love any of those suggestions, but they're better than Grammar Nazi. Also, I do like the term Grammarista after Fashionista. The Ista suffix is simply the Italian or Spanish version of the Ist suffix, which means someone who practices or is concerned with something. So if you're a Grammarista, you're someone who practices or is concerned with grammar. Some people would argue that grammarista is too positive to replace the sentiment of grammar Nazi, but many people who proclaim themselves to be grammar Nazis do so proudly, as if it's a good thing. So if that's you, grammarista is a great replacement. Your quick and dirty tip is to avoid calling yourself a grammar Nazi. You have better alternatives. Thanks this week to Lisa, Madam Mim, and Skyjack, who told me where they listen. Lisa listens from Palm Beach, Florida, and sent the first cat picture I've received. She says it's her kitten, Arthur, who is a naughty Bengal who has more Instagram followers than she has. Madam Mim listens before bed because she says nerdy stuff is relaxing. (laughs) I guess I'll take that. And Skyjack on Twitter listened while driving around Flathead Lake in Montana and posted a beautiful picture of the lake. Thanks to all of you. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my old podcasts and articles at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening.